For our devotional message today on Good Friday, as we look toward Easter, I decided to share with you one of my favorite Easter stories. It's called John, and it's from a collection of short stories called The Lost Angel by one of my favorite authors, Elizabeth Gouge. I hope you enjoy it. It struck him suddenly that it was odd to be bothering to sweep the floor when the world had come to an end and love was dead. What was the use? And by the light of a candle, too, one could not see to sweep properly by the light of a candle. But there had to be a candle because it was night. The light of the world had been put out and it was night. He stopped and looked down for a moment in the dim light at the broom handle and his thin brown hands tautly holding it, clutching at it in a stupid, desperate sort of way, as though it was a spar of wood that kept him from drowning. Well, so it was. The everyday tasks, chopping the wood, carrying the water from the well, washing the dishes, sweeping the floor, did keep one from drowning in grief, going mad from the shock of what one had seen, what one remembered, what one had done, what one had done. That was the worst of it. He had run away. They had all run away. If they hadn't, it might not have happened. Not that he was concerned with what the others had done. It was his own running away that was the weak trembling of his limbs, the tight band of pain jammed down over his temples, the stabbing through his hands and feet, the appalling knowledge in his mind that his pain was only the feeblest echo of the pain he had seen. And yet his friend who had borne it had never run away. Courage forsaken by cowardice, truth betrayed by lies, love tortured by hatred, life put out by death. And then darkness and the ending of the world. He had run away. He'd come back, of course, but it had been too late. Nothing to be done then but stand there through the endless hours and watch it happen. The sight searing through his brain and the agony of his helplessness choking him. Too late then. It had taken him exactly two minutes to run away. But the agony of his friend had gone on for hours. If he could only have back that two minutes and do it again, do it differently. But he couldn't. It was too late and love was dead. In spite of a confused feeling of unbelief, he knew that must be true because for a moment or two, while Joseph smoothed out the winding sheet, he had held love dead in his arms. Dead because he had run away. Lord God, help me, he prayed. I'll go mad if I go on like this, like those poor devils who used to fall screaming at the master's feet, and he'd put on his hands and hold them steady. But there was no one now to hold him steady, to hold any poor wretch steady. He'd seen to that by running away. Stop it, you fool. Stop thinking. He began to sweep the floor again, and the dust went around and round in whirls. He couldn't seem to get the dust where he wanted it. He was a complete fool. When he carried in water from the well last night, he'd only stumbled over the door sill and upset the bucket. And Mary, his mother too now, had mopped up the water and comforted him. In greater grief than any of them, yet it was she who was their strength. But then she had not run away. She only, of all of them, was guiltless in the darkness of this night. She had the strength of her sinlessness and of some memory to which she clung, something her son had said about the third day. There was a vague memory of that in John's mind, too. It was the source of that feeling he had that death could not be true, but his confused mind could not seem to get hold of it. What was happening? The candle flame dipped and swayed. The floor seemed slipping away beneath him, and there was a rumble like thunder. Only another earthquake shock. He steadied himself. Usually earthquakes terrified him. Only nothing mattered now. But he hoped the women would be safe, going through the dark streets to the garden. But there was no further shock. That was all except that the atmosphere seemed curiously freshened, as though a clean wind blew down the world. 
Yet there was no wind. There was something, though. He blinked his sleepless red-rimmed eyes and looked about him. What was it? Light. The endless night was over, and the first light of dawn was slowly filling the little room, flowing into it like water through the small square window. The light lapped about his body, which ached with such an intolerable weariness. It seemed to rise about him, taking away the pain. It was a brightness about the broom handle, and it touched his hands. He felt that it held his hands. He had always been a highly strung, restless sort of creature, and when he was nervous and excited, his hands would shake. Sometimes the master had put his own hand over them, holding them still. Not often, because the master had never been very free with his caresses, his love not being of that type. The grasp of the hand, the word of endearment were given when they were necessary, but not when they were not. Yet now, as the light rose and strengthened, he distinctly felt the grasp of a living hand. He knew the feel of that hand so well, wide across the palm because accustomed to the handling of an oar, hardened by the tools of his trade, the fingers very strong and supple. Yet the hardness and the strength had given a reassurance more comforting than any softness, and the warmth of the hand had always sent a glow of courage right through one's body. He felt that glow now. It rose with the light and reached his heart, which had been thumping so oddly. It reached his sore eyes and aching temples. Just his fancy, of course, about the touch for the master was dead. But straightening himself, he found that day had come and his splitting headache had gone. The broom was not so heavy now, and there was strength in his body. He got the dust where he wanted it, opened the door, and swept it out of doors. He knocked the broom handle against the side of the door and then paused, for it was such an extraordinarily lovely dawn. It struck him as odd that he should be able to notice the loveliness, but he did. It was still very early yet. Yet the pearly light held already some faint rumor of the coming glory of the sunrise. It held colors soft and delicate as the colors of a reflected rainbow, incredibly gentle yet pervasive, as though the world in sleep had soaked up mercy like the air we breathe. Why did the word mercy come to his mind? There had been no mercy in the world two days ago. Mercy with love had died, yet today, in this dawn, it was alive again. There was still that freshness in the air. He took great gulps of it as though it were cool water from a well. He leaned against the door and the blessed coolness of it seemed gently to close his eyes. It was incredible relief to keep his eyes shut for a little while. He had scarcely been able to close them the last two nights because of what he saw when the lids came down. He had not known before that memory could paint such pictures upon closed lids. Perhaps that was one of the things that drove men mad, looking at the pictures they saw when they closed their eyes, things they'd seen, things they'd done. Perhaps that was what was torturing Peter, for he'd lain all night with closed lids yet not sleeping. But no, it wouldn't be what he saw that he couldn't, could hardly bear, for he hadn't been there. It would be what he heard, his own voice speaking. Three times over he'd said it. At the first cock crow this morning, a rigor like the rigor of death had seemed to take his body. John, lying beside him on his mat, had got up and come downstairs to sweep the floor, for he had known that the only thing he could do for the man at that moment was to leave him alone. He wished Peter could hear what he was hearing now, the singing of birds. They were waking in the gardens of Jerusalem, and their liquid notes were cool as the air and beautiful as the newborn light. Were they singing like this in the garden where love was laid in the tomb, the garden where the women were? The women had left the house very early while it was yet dark with the spices for the embalming. 
There had not been time for that on that fearful Friday night. They had not been able to do more than wrap their dead master in his grave clothes, dead. But the word that in spite of his queer unbelief had been stabbing him like a spear in his side for so many hours no longer stabbed him. It was as though the wound had healed, as though the word itself was dead. He opened his eyes and saw the whole of the sky covered with small, crisp, rosy clouds like feathers with behind them an incredible depth of blue. And the scent of flowers came on the wind. It was then that he heard the running feet coming so lightly and quickly, yet with such a desperate urgency. He stood braced now, one hand pressed against the door, his heart beating in sickening thuds. For he knew, even before he saw her, who it was who was running down the street. Only Mary of Magdala had such fleetness of foot. Only she could put such a note of eager desperation into all she did and was. She was with him in a moment, clinging to him like a child, the veil fallen back from her bright head, and like a child she was crying and gasping and talking all at once so that he could make out nothing of what she was trying to tell him. Her clamor hurt him. It hurt the stillness and peace of the heavenly dawn. He pulled her inside the house and shut the door. Mary, be quiet. Don't cry like that. What's the good? And I can't understand. But he held her gently, for he was gentle by nature. And grief had so completely locked them all together through these dreadful days that all of them who loved their master seemed now one body. And then the passionate simplicity of Mary's childlike nature always called forth protectiveness. She poured her whole being into the joy or despair of the moment so that like a child, she must be held in safety till the storm was past. They have taken him away. They, they have taken him away. He's not there, she gasped. Who have taken him away? What, what are you talking about? The robbers, he's gone, John. John, robbers have stolen the master. That's not possible. They stealed, sealed the stone and set a guard. It was not John who had spoken now, but Peter. He had heard her crying and had come to them. And though he was in greater misery than John, he was at the moment more clear headed. For him, the impossible thing had happened and the unbearable thing was being born. He knew his master had died. He knew it better than John did, who had seen him die. There is a sense in which it is easier to know a thing if you have not seen it. John's mind these last two nights had beaten this way and that in confusion among the unbelievable things he had seen, so that he had become exhausted by unbelief. But his had lain still with the impossible in cold agony until at last he knew it true. And the truth about himself, he knew too. The loyal, courageous hero of his daydreams, the man whose love would never deny or forsake, however hard the test, did not exist at all. He was a man without courage, without loyalty, without truth, and without love. For two nights he had lain with the unbearable knowledge. But at the sound of Mary's crying, he had got up, bearing it, and had gone to see what he could do. Such acceptance had made him very clear-headed, but it had also aged him. The sight of his face when she raised her head and looked at him over John's shoulder stilled Mary's lamentations as John's and gentle endearments had not been able to do. She had not known before that a man could become old so quickly as this. Sit down, Mary, said Peter quietly. He took her from John's arms and sat her down on the stool. He stood by her and awkwardly stroked the braids of her hair. For a moment, she was quieted and said sensibly, the stone has been rolled away and the guard has gone. They fled in a panic. You can see they did because there's a lantern overturned and a couple of spears left behind and the grass and the flowers are trampled when they ran. It was grave robbers. You can see it was. And then the horror of it came over her again, and she jumped up, twisted herself free from John's detaining hand, and ran for the door. 
She collided there with Salome, John's mother, and Mary Cleopas, but she pushed them away and ran out into the street and away again like the wind. It seemed to her bruised mind that if she went back to the garden again, perhaps she would find him. Mary, cried Salome, come back. Let her alone, said Peter heavily. Is it true, Salome? Both the older women, breathless and panting, for they too had run through the streets, began to talk at once. Until now they had been calmer than Mary, for they had lived longer in this world and had known the death of many hopes and stood by many graves. But now they were nearly as incoherent as she had been, but with joy, not despair. For the tomb was not empty, they said. There were two men there, sunlit they seemed. Yes, sunlit in that dark place. They sat one at the head and one at the foot where the body of Jesus had lain, and they said the Lord was risen. Not stolen, but risen. Mary, poor girl, had not seemed to see anything. She had not waited to hear and see. She had never had much patience, poor Mary, and without patience, there is neither hope nor faith nor vision. But they had heard and seen, not seen exactly, for they had not been able to look on those shining faces, nor heard, really, not like you hear men speaking in the ordinary way, yet they had heard, like you hear news that shakes you in the song of a bird, a shepherd's pipe calling in the hills, a child singing at the well. You hear and you set down your pitcher and the tears are on your face. But they knew what they had to say. They had to come quickly and say, he is alive. He is risen. Lo, I have told you. Bird told you. The shepherd's pipe, the child singing at the well, the sunlit man who had looked down at the slab of holy stone and then passed his hand across his shining eyes. They said the same thing. Afterward, John could hardly disentangle the women's confused words from the thoughts that had lit into flame in his own mind. Nor did he remember how he had got himself out into the street, away from the women's talk and from Peter's sad eyes that looked pitifully upon them and thought they talked the nonsense of silly women who have borne too much. There seemed wings on his feet for a while, and then he heard Peter calling after him and slackened speed that the older man might catch up. They ran for a little side by side, but they could not speak. Peter, because he was panting with the exhaustion of John's speed. John, because of the tumultuous hope that was in him. Now and then he looked at Peter, but the man's rugged, furrowed face was still set in the lines of his stony grief. He ran so doggedly and so desperately because he thought they might yet catch the robbers. But he could not stay the course. The sweat started out on his forehead and he gasped and stumbled as the pain caught his side. John ran on and came first to the tomb. But he could not go in. His nature, fine drawn and sensitive, was not disciplined enough as yet to have attained to that perfect poise he had so worshiped in his master. His own will was still beloved by him. His master, though far more highly strung, more intensely sensitive than he, had been held in perfect balance by an, the iron strength of his devotion to the will of God. But John swung this way and that, intensely happy when things want, went as he wanted them to go, miserable when they did not, now courageous, now afraid. When he was with his master, he had felt like a small boat, swinging with the tides yet safely moored to a great strength. He would not be swept to disaster, either one way or the other, while the rope held. But two days ago, it had seemed to break, and there had seemed no bottom to the misery into which he had fallen. But there had been a bottom, because there had come that unbelief in the fact of death the peace of the fair dawn, his winged feet, his hope that as the misery had only seemed to be bottomless, so the rope had only seemed to break. But now he could not go in. 
His frail boat had swung the other way. If he were to go in now and see no shining ones, see only the empty slab of cold and cruel stone, or worse still, a heap of tumbled grave clothes flung there by thieves, then it would kill him. It would be the last thing he could not bear. He leaned against the rock, panting from his run, his heart thudding, his head buried in the crook of his arm, and the pictures began again in his mind, this time not pictures of what he had seen, but of what he might have seen if he had watched the thieves in the tomb. Peter came up to him, paused a moment, and then with something of his old impetuosity went on into the tomb. But John could not follow him. If he went in, he would see the tumbled grave clothes. But he had courage, and it returned to him as the thudding of his heart quieted. He must go in. He must know one way or the other. And he could not leave Peter alone in there. Moving gallantly now, with the grace of his youth, he bent his comely head and went in. He saw no heavenly spirits, and the light was dim. He saw Peter on his knees, staring stupidly at the slab of rock where the master had lain. And then he saw what he had dreaded to see, the grave clothes left behind. And in truth, it was as though he died. He could not groan or cry out. He was too cold. He just stood there, gripped by the cold. This was death, this cold. To have had the glorious hope and lost it, to be forsaken of hope, to be forsaken in this cold. Was this what the master had felt when in the dark garden they had forsaken him and fled? His mind, which had been so hot and confused, was suddenly coldly clear as Peter's had been. He and Peter had changed places now, for looking at Peter's face, he saw only bewilderment there, not a full comprehension of the fearful thing that had happened. He looked back again at the grave clothes and the whole terrible clarity of his mind became focused upon them. They were not in a tumbled heap. They lay in dignity, every fold in place. No human hands had touched them since the hands of the Marys had so disposed those folds. And the small bunches of herbs that the women had placed here and there among the folds were still where they had put them. Only as there was no body within the grave clothes, they had sunk gently to the stone by their own weight, just as a lily flower might fall softly to the ground below, still keeping its perfect shape. The shape of the grave clothes was very perfect. Naturally, thought John, for the shape of the body that had been withdrawn had been perfect. And the shape of his head, too, the napkin lying apart by itself kept the shape of the head. No one had disturbed it. God had taken to himself his human body once again with supreme gentleness as well as supreme power. But the gentleness and the power had for John a most dear familiarity. Without knowing what he did, he fell on his knees too. He wondered why he had thought the tomb so dark, for the light of the sun filled it. He saw no heavenly spirits. For him, they were not necessary. He heard no voice speaking, but he heard the birds singing outside in the garden. Was the master outside in the garden? Mary perhaps had seen him. Yet John stayed where he was, for he who had forsaken his Lord did not deserve to see his Lord, but he knew that he would see him again, if not in this life, then in another, because the gentleness and the power were but different aspects of eternal mercy. John could wait. Length of time no longer mattered. Nothing mattered but the fact of life.